All right, we are live. So uh, my name is Cameron Flatt. I am the digital managing editor for Vox Magazine. And today we are here to do this kind of almost round table discussion of our most recent feature covering human trafficking. And today this meeting will be kind of uh, organized by one of our digital editors, Molly. Molly, please go ahead and take it away. So yeah, like Cameron said, I was one of the digital editors on the story from Slavery to Stalis. Um, and today we kind of just want to talk with the writer and the two editors um, about how the story kind of came to be in the process of writing and editing it um, into making it April's feature. So I wanted to start with Alex. Um, uh, I know you have a history of um, with the Stop Human Trafficking Coalition of Central Missouri as an intern. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, about your background there? Yeah, so I started with the coalition this last summer, around June, I was connected to Nanette Ward, who's the founder of the coalition. And we talked a little bit about involvement and what was decided was my role in the coalition would be to write interview and write short profiles on the trafficker, on the trafficking survivors for the coalition's website as success stories. So I, over time I interviewed, oh gosh, like six or seven different survivors um, stemming from issues like their stories or where they are right now or the services that they need to like progress in their in their future goals and whatnot and I published short pro uh, profiles for them for their website those are not available yet though so then how did you kind of make the transition from writing short profiles to um, working on this long feature yeah, so it wasn't actually my idea. Um, I was in Jen Rowe's intermediate writing class and we had to pitch our long feature project for the year. And I'd been looking at a couple different ideas and I'd been talking with Jen about what I was interested in, what I liked doing. She knew I worked with the coalition and I'd submitted that as one of my ideas, but it actually wasn't one of my top choices because I was afraid that because I had a connection, even if it was a reporting connection with the coalition, I was afraid any connection wouldn't work. But she encouraged me saying that, you know, this is what you're truly passionate about. This is what you already have a lot of background on. This would be a great topic to explore. And I personally really enjoy writing profiles and I'm really passionate about human rights issues. So it ended up being a perfect fit. Did it take any convincing or kind of longer time to get the subjects for this story considering such sensitive material and content? Yes, I would definitely say it did. Um, so the main source, Amy, um, she was pretty willing to speak with me right from the get-go. Obviously she was nervous about being in such a large publication. So our relationship developed over multiple interviews, um, multiple conversations about what it would look like, what her participation would be. Um, the coalition was really um, open and willing to speak with me. I had pretty much a lot of the expertise sources were very open. I had a little difficulty with True North just because they are so busy, but once they heard about what the article was on, they were very happy to talk with me. But a lot of it was just difficulty arranging topics on such a difficult issue. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but. Um, and then my next question was, how did you deal with handling um, interviews with the survivors and talking and discussing and writing about the heavy content such as domestic violence, sexual assault, and self-harm? So I was lucky that when I was doing a lot of the reporting, I was in another class on trauma reporting. And I spoke a lot with the professor of this class, Catherine Reed, about what I was working on and how I was struggling with it. Because it is really dense, difficult material. And I learned coping strategies through that class on how a journalist can handle covering dramatic content. So that entailed everything from after I had interviews, especially with my main source, I would step back and I wouldn't work on the article for a few hours. I would hang out with friends. Um, I would do something that I enjoyed. I would go shopping, like whatever it might be. Um, as for making certain that the material was delicately said, 
but honestly said I made certain that I went over every fact, every sort of um, wording, both like with re outside research, but I also went through it with the source multiple times to make certain she felt comfortable in how it was portrayed, as well as spoke with the coalition on proper like terms and proper usage. I took that class. It was an amazing class. I think like so many more journalists should take it. It was you learn so much. Um, and then, so this question for, is for the editors, um, Meg and Hannah. Um, were so many details of the story seem important or heavy and things like you can't leave? How did you make the decision of what to keep versus what to cut? Because obviously we can't, we only have so much space. So how can you, how did you make the decision of what to keep and what to cut in the story? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Alex had done a really great job and because she had you know been working with the coalition she was thinking about a lot of those things so there really wasn't a ton of uh, work for us to be doing but um, we worked closely with Nanette from the coalition and Karen um, usually it's our policy not to share stories with um, sources before we print them but because this is such a sensitive subject matter we decided to make an exception to that so we shared it with them beforehand and had them read through it and got their input on what, what details we should include and which we shouldn't um, because they're the experts and they know ultimately um, what's best for the survivor and for really just everyone included. So we definitely relied heavily on them and their expertise. And um, yeah, I would say that was our biggest uh, method. I don't know what you would add, Hannah. No, I would agree. I would say that the open communication we kept with the sources throughout the process was really helpful. And I think Alex did a really good job of writing it really tightly, but also really detailed, like every sentence has an impact. So then my next question is, you know, a lot of Vox, um, being a magazine has really bright visuals, very pic like very picture oriented. How did you guys decide to do kind of the black and white theme, um, the minimalist graphics for this piece? Sure. So our designer, Mitchell, who couldn't be here today, um, we worked with him throughout the production process. We wanted something that was um, minimal just because we couldn't use photos of the subjects. And um, we also wanted something that was kind of symbolic. So in the story, we referenced that some surviving uh, survivors will have barcode tattoos to show that they can be exchanged for goods or services. And so we cut, he kind of took that barcode idea and applied it throughout the spread. It's really cool looking. And in reference to color, um, you know, the designers originally were thinking maybe we use like a deep burgundy or something along those lines. And originally we were like, that's great, go with it. But um, as we continued working on the story and found out that re the color red is um, the survivor's biggest trigger, that was a decision we made to just stick with black and white. So I think that's kind of an example of how we decided to uh, handle this story as we went step by step and try to be um, as sensitive to as possible. And now I'm just showing um, the PDF version of the magazine piece um, so the viewers can see the graphics. Um, like Hannah mentioned, the barcodes that was something mentioned in the story about how that's, you can brand the um, survivors uh, while they're being trafficked. And I think that really added a lot of deep and meaningful um, graphics. So like I said, minimalist, it adds some really good meaning. And I think it really made the piece feel more, um, give a higher impact. Yeah, but I definitely knew visuals were going to be tough on this one because we couldn't use photos or, you know, we didn't really want to get into illustrations because it's, we didn't want to be graphic or gruesome. You know, the story is uh, disturbing. There's some disturbing elements in it. So we wanted to pare down on the visuals. So it was definitely um, one of the most uh, difficult parts of this discussion was figuring out how we would handle that. But um, Mitchell was really great about, about working through it. And then this is for all three of you. Um, what were what was a statistic or a fact you discovered while working on this story that shocked you, or was something you had no idea about? I can start. Um, I was surprised by how many 
uh, people are trafficked by those that they know, like intimate partners or family members. I just, I feel like I always got it in my head that it was this uh, abduction scenario that you had to look out for, but it really isn't. I think um, I had worked a little bit with the subject matter before, so I knew a lot of the popular statistics that are thrown around. I was mostly surprised. Um, I think when I first started learning about this topic, how little there is known about it and how few statistics, reliable statistics there are. Um, so there's really not a lot. Um, one that we included that I found surprising, and I don't remember the exact figures, but it's in the story, is about um, the percentage of missing children that are thought to have been victims of trafficking. Um, I remember finding that and just being like uh, very surprised by it. For me, um, it's, I guess the biggest thing for me when I was working on it is I didn't realize how many different types of people can be impacted by human trafficking like you always imagine it to be um women you always imagine it to be lower socioeconomic classes occurring in another country but i over time working on this article and with my other background i spoke with people who were trafficked as young as five years old as old as four years old that came from all different socioeconomic backgrounds and and also the women we spoke to were all from colombia or the or the mid Missouri area, so just the the surprising statistic that it really could happen to anyone really got to me. Molly, you're still muted. I was on mute. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, have you guys received any reader feedback or any um, been contacted by anyone who read the story? Um, positive or negative reviews on it at all? I mean, I I have. Um, I know my my friends commented to me, text me saying they really liked it. I had some people reach out to me um, saying that they enjoyed the story or um, I had a couple comments on like Facebook saying that they found it, they were wondering how difficult it was to write and edit because of the subject matter. I think that was the most common question or comment was about the difficulty of the content. Yeah, and I think um, it's not exactly a uplifting feel-good piece. It's not one that people are going to be like, wow, loved reading this. But um, we know from our analytics that it is being read. And so it's being read and people are sharing it. And that I think says the most because really it's not like the biggest benefit and the biggest impact we can make is having people read it and know that this is happening. So um, I think, you know, it's kind of like an unsaid compliment in my opinion. I'm going to interject just real fast. We've got a couple questions. Uh, so we have a uh, live chat on next to the uh, the stream on YouTube. We had a couple couple questions asking, "What is the code?" Can you guys possibly not? It's kind of a very short question. I'm not sure exactly what it's asking. The code to get in and view it. I am not sure. Oh, do they? I don't know. If this is reference to something from the story. I don't know if this is reference to maybe the. You have made reference to barcode tattoos. I'm not really sure. Oh, maybe the barcode? I mean, I could I could go into that, I guess, a little more. I know <laughs> I touched on it, but basically a lot of trafficker, a lot of perpetrators will um, force tattoos, uh, for, force their victims to have tattoos or brands um, showing that they are owned property. So a lot of times these symbols can be barcodes um, or money bags or jewels showing like a monetary value. I don't know if that answers their question, but. Yeah, I think bodies as commodities is kind of the whole metaphorical theme behind the code, if that's the question. Okay, then we can also probably now uh, transition so for the for the viewers that aren't really familiar with how magazines do this, the the print is done first. The story is written, goes through editing, and then the print version is created. But then a different team creates the digital orientation of the page, and that was done by Molly as well as another digital editor, Madeline. So I'm going to share that now. And Molly, you you were brought on pretty late to discuss, to create the, our digital version 
of the story. What was that process like? Yeah, I was brought on, I think, um, basically like a couple days before it was meant to be published online. Um, so I was kind of stressed out because I, you know, was unfamiliar with like the backgrounding and feature meetings happen for weeks prior. So I felt like I was kind of um, behind where, um, but Madeline was amazing. She helped me kind of get caught up on everything. Um, and so we worked really well together on it and we got a lot of things done before um, published day. Um, so it was really nice because having a partner who was more uh, knowledgeable on what was happening helped out tremendously. Um, one of the biggest things we were worried about was visuals um, because we only had three, um, you know, photos or graphics. So, but I think we kind of made it look very pleasing with the um, main photo and then the parallax photo as you scroll down with the barcode. Um, right, yeah, right there. Um, I think making it a digital story, this one was very difficult in the sense that, like I said, we didn't have many visuals to go off of or many, um, because I got on late, we didn't, couldn't really think of the extra things to add, like more graphics or more, you know, statistics and things like that. But overall, I think as Hannah and Meg mentioned earlier, Alex Xander wrote a very, very concise story that didn't need any editing from our standpoint or much um, tweaking or, and everything, how we did it flowed really nicely with the sidebars and the different graphics and things like that. So from an editing standpoint, though I came on late and I thought it was gonna be like the end of the world, it was really one of the easiest features I've done. So that was really nice. Um, and one more thing I wanted to ask was, is there anything else like you guys think um, readers should know or people should know about the story or about the um, was uh, Stop Human Trafficking Coalition of Central Missouri or, you know, general sex trafficking um, or human trafficking in general that people should know? Uh, in regards to the coalition, I know they always need help and volunteers and, and any kind of help they can get. So if you're interested, if it's a cause that moves you or if you felt encouraged by the story to take action, definitely reach out, start going to their meetings when they start having meetings again um, and see how you can get involved because it's a really great cause. They're really great people to work with. Um, another uh, way is if you know anyone or if you yourself is in a situation where you could, where you feel that you may be trafficked or someone may be trafficked, please reach out and contact someone, literally any major, so like lo local law enforcement can be very helpful, uh, women, local women's shelters. So True North is the women's, uh, the domestic violence and women's shelter in Boone County. Um, there's others throughout Missouri. Um, you can always contact the National Human Trafficking Hotline, which I do not know the number off the top of my head, but it's listed in the story. You can also just, if you just type in human trafficking, it's like one of the first things that will pop up in a Google search engine. Um, you can contact the Polaris Project, which runs the Human Trafficking Hotline, and they will also help you get in touch with resources. And specifically, if you are in the Mid-Missouri area, contacting the Central Missouri Stop Human Trafficking Coalition. Um, if you just give them a call and tell them if there's your situation, they will help you. Um, actually, Alexandra, I thought of one more thing. Oh, sorry, Hannah. No, that's all right. <laughs> I just want to something really quickly. Yeah, I just wanted to put in, we really wanted to make sure that all of those resources Alex mentioned were in a sidebar in the story, so they're really easy to find for readers. Um, sorry about that again. Um, with the quarantine and people being forced home, one of the bigger um, concerns I've been recently reading a lot more about is women, um, men, or children stuck with their abusers in a home. Has Have you heard anything from the Coalition or True North or any organizations on ways they're looking to help women who are stuck in those situations? Or is this all pretty relatively new, so they're working it out as they go? Um, 
as far as, for, as far as me personally, I haven't heard anything from the coalition or True North about specific actions they're taking right now. It is a very serious issue. Um, survivors that are currently stuck with their perpetrators are more likely to experience abuse, are more ex likely to experience uh, various types of traumas, assaults, are more likely to have their uh, traumas prolonged. Um, because COVID-19 is something that's, I guess, relatively new, and the quarantine is relatively new. Um, I can't speak on their behalf, uh, but I can, I can only guess that they're working hard to do that, that in local law enforcement. I think that's all the questions I had for this discussion. Um, does anyone else have anything they'd like to include? <laughs> I want to give just a shout out to the editors because you guys were amazing and you don't give yourselves enough credit and the story was did have a lot of edits and you guys were extremely helpful I mean the story was originally backwards in chronological order um, before you guys came along so just editors don't get enough credit and you guys should okay well thank you so um, much to everyone for joining today um, this has been an awesome discussion. We appreciate all your hard work for all your stories. Thank you to everyone who watched today. Please make sure to read the story if you've not already. Uh, share it. This is a really important topic that everyone really does need to know about. I know there's a lot going on in the world today, but once kind of life returns to normal, unfortunately, the situation will not have been resolved. And so it's up to us to continue to fight this as the people that know about it and to spread it and make sure there's awareness and action. Thank you so much again, and um, have a good day.